This conference will now be recorded. Excuse me, uh, uh, Chair Quila, this is Steve Fick. Do you have me on here? I can hear you. Okay, I can't get the, the computer to work, so okay. I just want to be sure we're on here. Thank you. Yep, I can hear you. Go ahead and get started with the work session. Uh, work sessions are an opportunity for discuss issues informally with staff and invited guests. The board encourages members of the public to attend work sessions and listen to the discussion, but there is generally no opportunity for public comment. Members of the public wishing to address the board are welcome to do so during the board's regularly scheduled meetings held twice monthly. So the first item is the board communication. And let's see, we'll start with Commissioner Banks. Is my mic on? Yep, can hear you now. Yep, excellent. Um, just, I've had a, a couple good meetings. I'm looking forward to uh, visiting with the 4-H, um, going to the board meeting this evening. That'll be that'll be exciting. And then I I spoke with and met um, most of our regional 4-H extension office here a couple days ago. Um, I'm just excited to to get to get going and um, meeting everybody that, you know, I'm now serving on committees with. Um, it's it's busy <laughs> and I'm having fun. So anyhow, um, hello everyone. Not too much to say other than that. Yep, it's uh, kind of like drinking through the fire hose your first uh, few weeks, Commissioner Banks, but you're gonna really enjoy the fair board and of course the 4-H folks, both great groups. So. Uh, you're going to be a great liaison for those, uh, for both. Commissioner Toyoka. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good you know, looking forward to we got our staff, okay? Human Services Advisory Council and the Public Safety uh, Coordinating Council this week. So really looking forward to that. Just been doing a lot of research, a lot of uh, reading of past agendas and minutes and <laughs> trying to make sure I'm up to speed before those meetings happen. Uh, the shout out today too is I went and got my second or the booster shot for the COVID-19, the vaccine today, and just wanted to state that, you know, the county, the staff has done such a wonderful job, the coordinating they do, um, how precision it is, it's just seamless out there. So thank you to all of them and their efforts and there's some great volunteers, great staff. So just thank you to everyone involved. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Toyka. Yeah, a lot of good teamwork there. Commissioner Webb. Um, I, I really have nothing. Okay. Commissioner Thompson. I, I see, uh, Commissioner Thompson, are you um, moving to a new location? He's going to be gone, so. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Hi. The problem is the commissioner's office doesn't have an adequate internet connection. So we thought we'd change things so that it worked better than last week, and unfortunately it doesn't. So life is growth experience. Thank you to the grace of the county manager. And Commissioner Thompson, do you have anything to report this morning? I guess um, afternoon. I'm just just thinking about teamwork and how to build trust among the commissioners so that we have good communication and we um, do the best job we possibly can for the people of Clatsop County. Yep, completely agree with that. I thought you would, thank you. And I don't have anything to report. I think we'll move right into the public health update. And uh, um, who's going to be providing that? 
Commissioner Quila, if we could, uh, since Commissioner Thompson's using Don's computer right now, if we could put that off and Don will talk in a little bit on that. Sure, we can do that. Okay. So if everybody's got the amended agenda for the work session, you'll see that uh, we have an item 1A, which is commercial fishing. Uh, this is one I wanted to put on, you know, we had the discussion about the uh, HCP and, and the timber industry, and I thought it would be a good kind of segue into discuss, discussing commercial fishing interests as well. I mean, we're all talking about the natural resources here on the, on the lower Columbia River and in Clatsop County and the allocation of these resources. I know back in uh, 2012 and 2013, I was uh, with the city of Warrington um, and there was a lot of discussion at the time about Senate Bill 830, which was uh, changing methods for, for harvest on the Columbia River. Uh, I, I know that uh, we sent a letter to the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife at the time, and so did uh, Clatsop County, and, and Peter Hudala was the chair at, at that time. Um, uh, Dirk Roan was a, a commissioner, and they sent a letter that's included in the packet um, talking about the commercial fishing interests and what these changes might be. And, and you know, it's always been a balance uh, uh, each year, and, and quite frankly, it's trouble for for gill netters and commercial fishermen on the lower columbia in order to uh, uh, realize the allocations that should be uh, available to them um, you know there are a lot of stakeholders we're talking about commercial fishing but also recreational fishing interests tribal interests and of course conservation interests for the perpetuation of the species so um, i asked steve fick uh, who's you know, really plugged into the, the commercial fishing community and salmon fishing in particular to, to join us today. Maybe give uh, the commission a little background on Senate Bill 830 and maybe uh, discuss some of the current, uh, you know, the current status of allocations on the Columbia River. So, Steve, um, are, can you hear me? Yes, I do, uh, Chair Puyola. Do you hear me okay, everybody? Yep, yep, I can hear you. Thank you. First of all, Chair, I appreciate your concern with these issues, and uh, it's very important to our uh, community for many reasons. Uh, salmon is something that uh, creates a lot of opportunity, both for those that are in the fishing, seafood processing industry, but almost everybody in this community sometimes has been touched by salmon in their life. It's, uh, you know, everywhere from uh, being a, a part of their income to maybe maybe working working in a cannery when they were growing up or fishing and getting to earn enough money to, to uh, have some income to get a life choices through uh, what kind of jobs they want to get trained in, go to college. It's, that's something that's was very important to me. I worked both in canneries and fished, and uh, it gave me a skill set uh, that I could make some life choices. And, and there's a tremendous amount of people, natural resources in general, create that for our our local economy. Uh, just real briefly, I'll, it, it's a very complicated issue, but just I'll give you a little background on one thing. The Columbia River is uh, managed for salmon harvest by Oregon and Washington, called, and that's through a process called the Columbia River Compact. Both states get together and they decide how they want to uh, open seasons, when they want to open, and they have to agree on that um, so that everything is consistent on both sides of the river. So that's called the Columbia River Compact. It's been in existence for over 100 years. And um, so that's how the main stem is managed. The Senate Bill 830 was passed July 25th, 2013 by then Governor John Kitzhopper. He called it a win-win. And the goals were to provide more fishing and harvest opportunity, increase economic value, create more selective harvest methods, uh, provide for gear change for some of the commercial sector, $1.5 million to get additional uh, netting and, and gear types to, to uh, retool for. Sadly, only 500000 of that was ever uh, sent into the fishing community. They wanted to increase uh, hatchery production in select areas and uh, 
here again, they were going to, uh, as one example with uh, the select area brights, which is a Chinook that comes back in uh, August and September, they were going to up the production to 3 million smolts uh, put into the river. That's been reduced to 300,000. So instead of increasing it 100%, they reduced it, you know, by 90% of, of what their goal was. And this, this uh, Senate bill also allowed for adaptive management. So what that meant, if some of the changes they were suggesting through fish, different fishing techniques, uh, which for things like uh, seines and fish traps, as examples, hook and line, if they didn't work out to make a more selective commercial harvest, we would have what's called adaptive management. And that process has been gone, going on since the inception of the bill, and that it, it hasn't worked. Uh, current, uh, we haven't improved opportunities in the sport fishing industry. The economy, uh, the economics for the commercial sector has been uh, lost by a minimum of 18% on some years. There's uh, no improved harvest me method uh, from what the existing gear types, which is a gill net, use gill net and what's called a tangle net, which can actually release fish alive if it's not the stock you want to catch. And that that is that is done through management of time area and gear type, mesh size. So that is something that can be adaptive management. Uh, we haven't seen any more additional fish put into some of these select areas. Uh, Steve Meske can maybe uh, comment on that later on. Um, and uh, right now, uh, Washington has done considerable work to come up with a proposal of uh, adaptive management. And uh, as of last week, there was uh, another subcommittee uh, meeting between Washington and Oregon's uh, Fish and Wildlife Commissions. And, and Oregon essentially does not want to make any changes which would make this a uh, economically equitable uh, program which is part of Senate Bill 830. The uh, commercial sector at no time was to lose less than 5% of the value of their fishery, which it's been significantly more than that. And uh, uh, Chair Quila had expressed this concern to me, so that's, that's kind of what I'm doing here. Um, but what, what has to happen here is, is um, I think we believe, I believe that we need to have the county commission uh, be supportive and engaged uh, in cooperation with the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the State of Oregon of how can we help manage our natural resources in our county more effectively and uh, help them be successful instead of this continued failure that is directly affecting your, your citizens. The other issue um, just coming forward is the Senate Bill 301 uh, by Senator Riley. He's in the Valley. Uh, uh, he represents some people there. and He wants to completely end commercial fishing as we know it on the Columbia River. No more gill nets, no more tangle nets. Um, and that is something I would hope maybe uh, your lobbyists and the Salmon Fall and West Coast Seafood lobbyist uh, Matt Marquis could maybe work on to better educate uh, legislators in Salem so that they can make a responsible decision on where to take that bill. But I hope that I hope that kind of gives it in a nutshell uh, where we're at here. And um, is there any questions? Well, my only question, I think that Port of Astoria is also considering or they're, they're also having a, a discussion of this on the agenda. I know our PacWest uh, uh, firm is here on, on the call. So I, your suggestion about maybe uh, uh, following Senate Bill 301 and talking with uh, Marquis and Associates down in Salem might be a, a good way to, to proceed on that. You know, we always talk about the working waterfronts and, you know, the, the history in Astoria with canneries up and down uh, of the shoreline, and, and obviously those days are gone, but people still want to see a working waterfront when they come to town. It's a tourist attraction. They want to see uh, salmon processing. They want, want to see salmon getting unloaded. 
uh, other other fish uh, being processed. You know, it's it's a part of the mix, and and, and certainly uh, we want to be uh, informed and, and and know exactly what is uh, uh, what is going on with the uh, allocation of resources on the Columbia River, and um, when we can be an advocate, be an advocate. Um, and so I, I think this is a discussion that we get we can continue to have. But I really appreciate the background, uh, Steve, that you provided. I know we have uh, Steve Meschke uh, on on as well. Steve, do you have anything that you would like to add? Are you talking to myself, Steve Pick? Or oh, Steve sorry. Other, other Steve, <laughs> Steve Meschke. No, I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah, so no, I know we just we just talked about this the other day in our office. You know, we saw the news release and we we're discussing it on our end. Um, you know, and just kind of one thing to add with Steve, just kind of clarify a few things. The state has been increasing us on fish numbers over the past couple of years. In fact, just last year, uh, we had an increase of uh, an additional 400,000 spring Chinook to Young's Bay. And we've had an increase of 225,000 fish out to our Nat Creek net pens. So the state has been pushing us to, to do more on our nets, but we pretty much maxed out our production. All our nets are full right now, um, and we don't have any more room. I know Nat Creek has had an increase. They've never released spring chinook from their hatchery, and they are releasing fish there. I think it's about 250 to 300,000. Big Creek is doing an, a, rele a release there also, and so is the North Fork Claskenine. So there has been increases coming down here um, as part of the, you know, the push off that measure 81, you know, and increasing the what the production is in the bay for the gill netters. So there has been a push for that, and there's been a push for more. It's just a question of where to put them. But um, the, the funding hasn't come through all the way, but they have been funding us this year, or they bought some food for us this year. But um it's it's a pretty dynamic situation but um we're doing what we can to keep keep the fish going out of the bay that's good to hear is so i, I guess i haven't followed it as closely uh, since i'm i've been out of the industry about what the harvest in young's bay which is off the main stem of the river so these are fish that are coming back specific to young's bay area not going up the river uh, what was the the season like last year? What what were the numbers harvested? Steve might know. It was. Better. Steve would have the better numbers. I know I have. I don't have my latest and greatest, but I know it was pretty dismal this year. That it was a lot lower than what it's been in the past years. That's what I've heard. Uh, yeah. Uh, Chair Chair Quiller, this is Steve Fick. Uh, yeah. To put it into perspective, is is this bill? Has, has taken away a lot of opportunity in the main stem and primarily they've taken away and most fisheries except for a fall Chinook fishery 99 percent of the uh, pre 830 fishing area and put it all into these select areas that were always intended to be supplemental to the main stem fishery and it's not an issue of conservation it's a concert it's an issue of sharing at your, your question you know, like spring salmon that Steve mentions, you know, the total, I think we, there was 4,000 fish caught, but they also took away the main stem opportunities that we have traditionally had, which we'd have up 10, 12,000. They're very valuable fish. So the most valuable salmon in the world, as far as, as, uh, for the consumer, highly desired fish as one example. In the fall, we, we, have had healthy coho stocks going to other areas main stem because they've taken away the the gill net tool um haven't been able to harvest uh meaningful amounts of fish where we'd have 150,000 fish harvested say in the fall on just an average year um you're talking a, a few thousand you know five to ten thousand fish they've taken away uh, a lot of opportunity. They forced all of our fall Chinook fishing in August and September for to be caught up, you know, 100, 150 miles away in that area up there and leaving this area down here, which we said we'll, we'll work however we make it work. But, you know, these areas down here have been totally given to the recreational fishery. And, and so that's had other consequences to 
the cost of operation and the opportunity to, to harvest fish. So those those are problems here and, and that was never supposed to be part of this bill, you know. And the other thing that is really frustrating for a lot of people I talk in the community is that there's a lot of a lot of these um, businesses like uh, guides. First of all, you cannot guide below Longview Bridge in Washington. Uh, so what they do is all those Washington guides come over here and they take take business away from Clatsop County and provide that service along with people that come from Idaho and the Portland metropolitan area guides that will come down here for two or three weeks, don't have business licenses, are not part of the community that I talked about earlier that you look at uh, as an example, when we built the swimming pool here in Astoria, uh, they needed another $250,000 to, uh, I call put the radio and the power steering in it. They had the pool built, but they didn't have the, the the other luxuries that we want to see. And in the, in the course of a sandwich in an hour, we raised a quarter million dollars around that table. The, about, I looked around, about 65% of that was from natural resource dollars locally, either through timber or seafood. And so this is, this is where I come back to how important this fishery is to so many other people than just, just the fishers and the processors. You know, we talk about it's a tourist attraction, yes it is, but it's also, we provide a, a, a reasonable fair amount of salmon into the consumer sector. I mean, on an average 10 year, if I took my 10 year average, I put out in the fall, I put out 200 tons of salmon. Uh, last couple years, it's been under 50. So what, it, it is meaningful economically, it is part of the fabric of a business plan for the, seafood producers, providing jobs, providing fresh seafood locally. So I just, um, please be cognizant of that, that it's, there's a, a lot of different avenues that this is a valuable resource. And there's a, there's a question of fairness in it too. And they've taken, uh, it's a extremely complex uh, management plan. I won't bore everybody with it, but a lot of it's based on how many fish that we want to protect can we kill to access the, the fish that are healthy to harvest. And that's called an Endangered Species Act harvest uh, number. And so right now, uh, that doesn't go to the tribe, the, the non-fishing public gets 20% and the recreational fishery gets 80% basically, except for in the fall, there's a 30% component of it. So, I mean, these are things that I think you, I would strongly urge you to be, uh, make uh, the commission and uh, the governor's office aware that you want to be partners in your own natural resources here so that uh, the people in this community can, can uh, enjoy and add value to it. Yeah, thank you, Steve. I, I appreciate the background. It is a complicated issue, one that we'll have to discuss uh, further um, we, we have kind of run out of time and uh, we have to move on to our next item on the agenda, but appreciate you being here and thank you, Steve Meski as well. Mr. Thompson, you got something real quick? I do, real quick. It looks to me like this is another case where we're being turned into a colony or a theme park because we're not being allowed to have working middle-class industries here. So I think I'd like to say more about how do we reclaim a reasonable economic development environment in the face of these challenges. I hope that's our focus. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate that. Uh, the term I like to use is the uh, elite's petting zoo. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> when they come here. So I thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve Fick, Steve Meski. Appreciate that. We'll move on Thanks. to the next next item on the agenda is the uh, 2021 legislative session update. And Pac West is here. Yes, Commissioner. I'll just introduce. We have Phil and Ryan, our lobbyists with the Pac West group, and so I'm just going to turn it over to them. And I think that that's perfect timing, coming off of uh, what Steve Fick just shared with us. So. Uh, Phil, if you want to go ahead and take over. Yes, absolutely. I'm going to just over to Ryan real quick to do some introductions, if that's okay with you, Monica. Awesome. 
Thanks, everybody. Uh, yeah, so Ryan Tribbett, we are your, uh, I'm the president of the PacWest Lobby Group. Uh, we're happy to be representing Clatsop County. Uh, you join uh, a portfolio of countries you've been representing in local government now for a number of years. And so we're happy to take on the, some of the uh, specific issues for your community that uh, may be beyond the reach and, of, uh, and bandwidth of the uh, Association of Oregon Counties, who we've worked closely with. Um, my background and some of you have, we have met uh, when we came up and did a tour recently, but uh, my background is on the public policy side of things. I uh, started back in 2003 and through 2008 was working as a policy advisor in the state Senate. Uh, Phil Scheuers, who uh, is on the team, uh, spent about 10 years working for the uh, ranking member on the Ways and Means Committee. So where I was policy focused, he was budget focused. Uh, and then we have Ann Johnson, who's also on the team. And she has spent uh, most of her adult life working in the state legislature as well. Uh, you probably remember Senator Joanne Berger, uh, and that was who she worked for for a number of years. And now that she's at PacWest, she works on uh, a variety of our local government clients and uh, with an agriculture focus as well. So um, what do we see coming down this time? Uh, a lot. There's uh, 2,100 bills dropped so far, and they continue to introduce more each day. Um, the Capitol building is officially closed still, but uh, they're doing meetings like this remotely, uh, which as you would think would have slowed things down. Uh, that was the sort of expectation going in, but uh, what we're seeing is uh, sort of I, what I consider like an unprecedented level of committee activity. Uh, the first day of uh, officially of session kicked off with 17 different committee hearings uh, all in one day. I was looking at it and uh, just yesterday there was 22. I have never seen in my uh, almost 20 years in politics that much activity uh, all in one time. So there's a whole lot of, um, a whole lot of discussion happening. Uh, but what we're seeing so far, at least, is not a whole lot getting done. Um, we see them addressing issues uh, mainly that were sort of left on the table uh, when the um, last session adjourned uh, sort of prematurely. And there was about 100 bills on the floor, a little over 100 bills. And so we see the committees going through and starting to take uh, some of that low hanging fruit uh that um unfinished business i guess you might call it um and then they have a whole variety of uh pretty broad sweeping bills that they've put forward uh in one of them that you guys were speaking about earlier uh 301 that's one we've been coordinating already with uh senator johnson's office on um but i think that because uh so much of the policy uh, conversation as a, a foundation in what's happening with the state budget. I think I'd like to kick it over to Phil to give us sort of a situational analysis of uh, what's going on with the state budget. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Um, so commissioners, uh, what we're looking at is trying to filter out through those 2100 bills, which ones of those might actually have legs. And as Ryan just uh, uh, noted, a lot of that is going to be done through the lens of the budget um right now the legislature is looking at just to maintain the current service level of the current what they're calling the law budget what was passed last session they're about a billion dollars short in the general and lottery fund area to to do that so they are systematically going through the ways and means processes now of reviewing agency budgets um they will do a preliminary review of all those agencies um start they've just started this week really of uh, starting to hear them they did orientations last week um but they'll go through this biennium's budget with agencies all the way through until about end of march and then they'll start talking about the same agencies in a round two version looking forward into the next biennium and so and i'll have to say i really appreciate monica and don you guys have been awesome as we've reached out saying, hey, this agency's up, anything we need to be alert for for the county, and they have been really responsive. So thank you for that. Um, and then as Ryan noted, all of these policy bills that are moving forward, like 301, 
will start being heard in these policy committees. And if there is a fiscal attached, they will then get sent to Ways and Means. Um, the good news is in a budget deficit, a lot of bad legislation that is expensive to implement doesn't pass. <laughs> um, we're hoping that there's a lot of issues that we're tracking that uh, could have some negative consequences for the county, um, but looks like it would be expensive. So um, we're going to be monitoring that um, and just really trying to keep you up to speed on what the budget, if they do budget reductions or go down a path of trying to look for more revenue to fill that budget hole, what does that mean to the, uh, to the county and shared revenues, agency services, things like that. We just are, it's a little premature yet because they're just in that round one of talking about current biennium services, um, but we'll start seeing that over the next week or two real conversations around agencies picking up pretty quick. So, and I'm gonna, I guess I can pause if there was questions on that or Ryan, you wanna go back uh, to you and then talk more. I, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. We've been hearing about Dogami. First, it was gonna be pulled apart. Now it's not gonna be pulled apart. You're cued in on Dogami, right? You know that you need to keep us really alert on that one? Yeah, we have been watching uh, what was happening in the governor's recommended budget. They uh, were recommending complete disillusion of Dogami, but the way, um, I mean, local governments probably don't need to hear this, you could shut down a certain department or agency that doesn't change or doesn't eliminate the actual need and the role that they're playing in that. And what was suggested was sort of taking the um the the permitting process for mining operations and the that area and handing it over to deq and uh we can not think of a more frightening agency to turn that responsibility over to than the deq we have met with uh senator johnson about it and others uh presiding officers and it does not look um like that bill's going to go forward i think the politically correct way is it's a very challenged uphill uh battle if that is to go forward it does not look like it enjoys very much support at all well but the point is dogami has never had state funding the reason it's been unreliable is it's not had adequate and stable funding so when you're looking at the governor's budget and the through the legislative process i hope you're adding in the cost of adequately funding dogami and just to highlight on that, Commissioner, just yesterday they had that hearing where they were talking about this uh, moving forward with keeping the agency whole. And because of just the proposal of cutting it, um, that that they missed out on a federal grant would have, which would have significantly funded a service. So um, hopefully we can change that course of direction. So. I had one question about uh, funding for SBDC. Do, you, do we know any more about that? So business organs budget will be up, I believe it is sixth in, in the row for, or the Oregon Business and Development Department, I call it business organ, sorry. Um, that will be sixth in row for the Transportation Ways and Means Committee. So they're still about a month away, um, of probably being heard but uh, they're starting to do that paperwork now and I should be able to see it here in about a week or two. So. Okay, thank you. Additional question about, um, uh, I call it Business Oregon too, the Seismic Retrofit Committee, is that gonna be adequately funded so that we can continue doing seismic retrofits around the state? Yeah. So um, but what I'm hearing um, is the governor's budget took, did take a pretty good chunk from Business Oregon. Um, they completely eliminated the industrial development or uh, district of lands um, positions, things like that. What I am hearing from Ways and Means um, is that they, they said, thank you, governor. We are going to start from where we are currently in providing services and develop a budget from there. So I don't think that the executive branch and legislature are on the same page. So that's good news to your, to your point, Commissioner, but we'll watch it for sure. I'm making a note. And same to you, uh, uh, Commissioner. So. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, we can continue going. Okay. Okay, Ann, uh, you were gonna talk a little bit about uh, the tone of the policy making process from your perspective with your subject matter area? Sure. My name is Ann. I just really wanted to introduce myself because I've never met y'all, but 
Um, I grew up in Coos Bay. The I grew up and went to Marshville High School. So, um, and then I worked for um, 16 years um, in the south, the South Coast uh, area on the House and the Senate um, for Senator Berger and Senator Roblin. And I worked with the Coastal Caucus for about seven of those years, helping them. So I feel like I, um, this is really a kind of a, a at home place for me to be. And I just want to tell you, I am watching policy. I watch any kind of policy that affects local governments. I also work with uh, the ag community. And I just want you to feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions um, involving anything that's coming up as far as policy concerns. I would be the person you would want to contact, and I really just wanted to say hello. And I'm really, really excited to be working with all of you. Thank you, Ann. Thank you. And then Commissioner Webb has a question. Oh, there we go. Okay. Commissioner Webb? I'm sorry, I, I'm still having intermittent internet issues at home. Um, uh, is there any um, danger um, of extensions funding, um, OSU extension funding being cut? Have, have you all has what, where does where does the higher education funding come in this process? Yeah. So if we're looking at OSU extension funding. Um, that's always, uh, and I forgive the political rhetoric here, it's always that political football that seems to be tossed out every session. It's always been proposed by governors to be cut and it always gets refunded by the legislature. Um, it has not been risen to that level this session, which is I think a good thing, um, but I do think that they are, they did get a proposal of a percentage cut, not a dramatic, dramatic one, but across the boards um, cut to try to balance. I will go have to pull that and get exact numbers for you, Commissioner. But um, I think it, it's just got a hairline. It's not been a target of strategic cutting yet. So yeah. Okay. So if, I, um, it, I will. It, I will it, add that they have a bill for um, to add an organic farming department, and it would add eight positions to uh, the extension office. And so we um, at, are working with some of the different ag groups trying to get that funded. And so we're optimistic at this point, but I will definitely keep that on the radar and keep you posted. Okay, I, I think one of the things that I always like to stress from our perspective um, on ag issues is that we have a, um, we have kind of an emerging um, ag uh, interest in specialty foods, um, mm -hmm. organics, etc., uh, and it's a very exciting, um, I believe, <laughs> uh, component of of our local ags. You know, we're if you take a look at a topo map, we don't have a lot of super duper good farmland. We're never going to grow wheat in, in Clatsop County, but one of the things that is that is tied in with our tourism and and other issues. Um, is that OSU extension is incredibly valuable to us. They provide us, a, we just after, I've been beating up on on, um, on OSU for the past two years about getting, a, filling up a, a vacant position that was a, a small farms agent. And we finally did it, yay, yay. Um, and th they, the extension in, in counties like ours, really provides us a wonderful research and technical assistance arm that we could never afford to be able to, you know, to be able to, uh, to fund at the county level. So any time that you need any, any um, facts or, or, um, or talks or witnessing, um, please let us know because uh, we really have a, we, we have a, what I think is a really important emerging economic development arm uh, here in our in our ag, and we we always need help. And right now we have fabulous extension agents, uh, and so we're we we don't want to lose. We, we don't want to go backwards. On, on this that, issue. That's great to know, and I will definitely that OSU extension bill just rose up to the top of my list. Okay. I will watch that closely for you. Okay, thank you. 
And I think you bring up a good point too, in that, um, you know, as much as there's um, sort of bad feelings about the capital being closed and people not having access to uh, their, their process, um, the legislative process, there is one thing that's sort of the silver lining and that's for uh, clients like you that are sort of a little bit off the beaten path that it would normally take you some time to travel in and it would be a big time commitment to do it and now with everything happening virtual it does make it a little bit more approachable for you guys to be able to participate in the process so um to the extent that there's a silver lining that then that is one right right so and we um, can always write we can always write yes um, so Thanks, Ryan. I, so we got a, just a couple more minutes. So I'll let Ryan kind of summarize here. Oh, okay. Um, well, I was just going to say we have the uh, we have the list of bills that we sent you guys that you should have. Um, and so uh, I know your departments are going through that. We try to rank them on a sort of one to three scale uh, based on the types of involvement that you want us to have on them. So like what we would consider a priority three is either like a monitoring type uh, situation where we would be reporting back. A uh, priority two is something where you might want us, want us to do some sort of logo work, work in a coalition, provide your logo on a page to support. Uh, and a priority one would be something where you want full level of engagement where we would be drafting you know uh for you know independent content original content uh testifying in committee meeting with legislators and actually uh trying to purposefully affect the outcome yeah that's that's fantastic i i am you know, so I glad that we that we have you guys representing us in salem we'll certainly take uh, an opportunity to uh to review those as a group uh, and provide you some feedback. But uh, thank you very much uh, for the report. Is any other commissioner question? Okay. Thank, thank you guys, you. Ryan, Bill, Ann. Thank you. Thank you so much. Like great thank to meet you. you. Uh, next is the potential transfer of property to the city of Astoria. And we have we have Mark, we have Mark Wynn Stanley, who's a short timer. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and the transfer would be to the city of Seaside, not the city of Astoria. Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. I just don't want Astoria to worry about getting a transfer of our property. So, <laughs> um, no, it's a pleasure to be here, and I was very interested in listening to uh, the questions about uh, the extension service. In a previous life, I was the supervising accountant for the College of Agriculture, and I used to work their budgets all the time. Uh, so uh, yes, if in, in those days, you just made a call to us and we figured out how to get it in there, Commissioner. Uh, so, uh, th but those were the old days. What can I tell you? <laughs> um, so about a year ago, uh, the city and the school district came before the commission uh, to ask to have property transferred uh, from uh, the county to the city of Seaside. This property uh, right now uh, has, has been enjoyed by uh, the school district for the last 60 years. Uh, but there are reversionary clauses on this property. Um, the property has been used uh, over the last 60 years for the children in uh, this area for both uh, school resources as well as community resources and and children from Cannon Beach, Seaside, Gearhart, uh, and even visiting teams from Warrenton and Astoria have used these baseball fields and soccer fields uh, for all these years. One of the things though that as the school district built their new property, uh, and they uh, decided that they were going to sell their uh, current high school site. Um, it became um, obvious that, that that property was gonna revert back uh, to the county. Um, and, and the community uh, feels that it would be very important that, that those sports fields continue to be able to be used uh, by the youth in this area. And so 
really what we're here for today is to ask that the uh, county commission uh, deed that property over to the city of Seaside so it can continue to be used uh, in the manner that it has been used uh, over the last 60 years. Uh, we have no issues with having reversionary clauses uh, placed on the property uh, and, and we don't have any issues with using the property just as it has been used in the past. Uh, for sports fields and for the enjoyment of uh, the citizens in this area from a park standpoint. So I'm here to answer any questions anybody may have. Um, and really the only thing we're looking for is authorization to uh, title this property over to the city of Seaside for use as parks. And then uh, Chair Quayla, if I might just uh break in just really yes. quickly thank you mark for, for for all that um so if you look at at your work session ma materials there were five tax lots um that that there was really four that there were five reverted um joanna did a little trading on two of them and so um from my understanding with uh com with a communication with with mark is that they're really interested right now in five thousand fifty one hundred and sixty one hundred i believe and correct me if i'm wrong mark and then and and that's kind of where they where their original interest lies and so we thought having mark here to give you an overview of how they would use the property and then staff will come back because there is some administrative process we have to go through to actually categorize the property um, but then we would bring it back to your board in another work session to go over that process but really this was the opportunity just to hear from mark um, what their desire is and what their use is thank you don uh commissioner toyoka you had a question uh i did i just kind of don fulfilled some of that i saw the you know the five different uh, tax lots and you know my understanding was that pretty much three of them or really two main ones that were used for soccer and baseball and then the other you know tax lots i don't know of the current use or use in the past you know um and then is there a plan as far as development for those sites or in and in budgeting for maintenance is there any of that stuff in place well, Commissioner, uh, the city will take responsibility for maintenance of it, just like it does for any of its other parks. So you can be assured that, that we will continue to take care of the property. Uh, there currently are a couple of baseball fields on that and a couple of soccer fields uh, on that. Uh, and as of right now, it will just be continued, we'll continue to use it in those manner, in that manner. Uh, Seaside Kids enjoys using these fields. Uh, actually, the school district is going to continue to use these fields. Uh, this is where their, a lot of their JV games take place, uh, things like that. So um, it's going to continue right now to be used just in exactly the same manner that it's been used in the past. Okay. That, my question is right now, because I know Seaside Kids, I'm familiar with that. I've, I can't even tell you how many times I've mowed that grass and, <laughs> and maintained that thing. Uh, it, you know, so it's been pretty much a volunteer effort to maintain it. So would the, the city have plans to actually do maintenance on that property? Yeah, we would do maintenance on it. But Commissioner, if you'd like to continue to volunteer, we'll certainly <laughs> let you to do that. Oh, I don't think that's where you were going, right, John? <laughs> uh, trying to get out of that business. <laughs> Thank you. Serpa, did you have anything? Um, no, we are just in the process of getting these property properties categorized pursuant to our policy. So I have sent the information out to our committee, waiting to get that back. And then once I have that back, we'll have one more little meeting with everyone present and then we'll bring it to the board for categorization and then we will bring the request to the board after that okay thank you uh commissioner bangs and then commissioner thompson 
Um, so I don't know the area as well as John does um, in regards to uh, fields available for kids to be playing on. Um, I know with Warrington, we have the Warrington Soccer Complex and, um, and sporadic uh, softball and baseball fields um, around the area. I was curious it, to see if anybody knew what fields we have available currently in that side of the county between like Gearhart and Seaside um, that are being used. And is this like an only one type situation or is it a situation of one of many? I see Commissioner Toyoka had an answer to that, I think. Yeah. I think I can help uh, Mark Winstanley on that one. The, in uh, South County, there's a there, there's insufficient fields and areas for the youth to play at this time. And losing the high school, losing some of those fields is going to make it a challenge. So, I, you know, we do need those available fields for the kids, you know, for the youth of the county. Um, we don't have viable alternatives at this point. So we need to preserve it. That's why I was questioning about maintenance and how we're going to maintain those properties for the youth sports. Yeah, and, and uh, thank you very much, Commissioner. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I think the other thing that I would point out is now that uh, Gearhart Grade School has sold, uh, the fields that are currently at Gearhart Grade School are no longer available uh, to youth. And so actually we've lost fields at this point. So. Yeah, thank you. Commissioner Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I don't either have sweat or cheers in these particular fields, but um, I appreciate the absolutely essential nature that they present for recreational and, and health opportunities um, for the youth and for the adults. As long as there's a reversionary clause, I don't see why anybody would want to object to this Really, we are all for it, I think. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? If not, oh, Commissioner Banks. Sorry, I have to wait for my microphone to always turn on. Um, in, in regards to, there are five lots there. How many lots, again, are the fields on? Is it only two or is it all five? It is three with the uh, four. Uh, the city is requesting three of the lots. Tax okay. lot 5,100 and 6,100. Okay. I just wanted the clarification. Thank you. You bet. I think that uh, Serpa and Dawn had both outlined kind of next steps. So are we comfortable? With Moving forward on this. Great. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Have a good day. You too. Next is the discussed uh, discussion of proposed ODOT change at the Highway 101, 104, and Perkins Road intersection. And we have 10 scheduled for this. And who is presenting on this? That will be Tony. Tony. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm Tony Snyder. I'm the area manager. Uh, I've been up in Astoria for two and a half years uh, with ODOT since 2002, mostly in the Salem area, and uh, got an opportunity to come up here. And uh, I'm not. I'm not a. Uh, uh, class of county resident. I actually live across the river in Owaco. So uh, <clears throat> that's all right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Senator Johnson done that I live in Washington for some reason, but uh, most everybody else has been understanding. <clears throat> uh, the Perkins Lane intersection, um, ODOT has a, uh, a SPIS program. It's, uh, it's our accident tracking program that we look at and we try to fund the top 5% or 10% of the uh, high accident locations around the state. And that's where our safety money goes for improvements. Um, this particular intersection 
Uh, the time frame it was looked at was 2013 to 2017. During that time frame, there were 13 tracked accidents and 10 of them with, with uh, injuries, no fatals. Uh, over half of those accidents were because of uh, it's during turning movements. You know, because you got four lanes of traffic going back and forth on 101, and then you have cars entering uh, and trying to take a left off of Perkins and trying to take a left off of the Fort Stevens Highway 104. And there's just too much going on. And as the traffic goes up and the gaps get smaller, because uh, you know in the summer, there's 20,000 cars a day that come through there. Um, so drivers get impatient uh, there. And so we funded this, um, the cost is 450,000 for design and 1.6 million for the construction. Um, when we put together our set of plans and sent them out for the county and city of Warrington to review, uh, some of the feedback we got was, you know, there hadn't been many accidents there lately. Um, uh, the school's coming in, uh, city of Warrington wanted elimination and, and we've added lighting to it so people can see. Um, and people and, and the county used um, uh, an ODOT laydown area there for some of its chips and stuff. And so for them, it changes their operation, and makes it more inconvenient for them to use it if they have to find a place to turn around and come back. Because in the project, we would eliminate certain moves. You wouldn't be able to go straight across from Perkins to um, Highway 104 or the opposite way. There'd be barriers in there. And so the only left turn that would remain is if you're heading north on 101, you can make a left into the Fort Stevens Highway. If you can make a right into Perkins, but Perkins becomes right in, right out. And you cannot make a left out of Perkins with our project. Uh, what we do, what this has done is simplified. Instead of 15 different movements or places that you can have conflict, we roughly cut it in half. Um, but some of the questions we were getting is, you know, is this is this a viable project? Should we be doing this? Is it worth it? Well, I was scheduled to go talk to the Warrington City Council on November 10th about this to find out their take on the project and what value they saw in it. And on November the 4th, uh, an ODOT rig with a couple of our permit staff was coming through there and uh, someone Drivers in attendance in attention. They left their lane. They clipped the back of an, an SUV with an elderly couple in it and spun them into the path of the ODOT vehicle. Um, the two people in the SUV were killed. It, it was a double fatal. The ODOT staff, um, they were in a new vehicle with airbags that we had just gotten, you know, six months before. Airbags deployed. And I just talked to them a few minutes ago to ask them what day was your accident. And they uh, went to the hospital to be checked out, but they walked away from it. And that airbag saved lives. So the city of Warrant has some concerns. Um, they're more concerned with speed in the corridor. They're more concerned with congestion on Ensign Lane, you know, with Wendy's and Home Depot and Costco and all those guys. Um, they're con they in the county were concerned with the speed in the corridor. Uh, yeah, the public works director, you know, Ted McLean, asked me the possibility of taking it because when people hit the four lane section, it turns into a racetrack. Everyone's, everyone wants to pass everybody else and the speed goes up. But one of the problems we have is there's so few places to pass that uh, uh, the city of Gerhardt has four lanes inside the city limits, you know, for one portion. The uh, the 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 ship. I don't know if he's sheriff or chief of police of Gerhart came to a meeting and was talking about the fact that it's hard to really do enforcement on that because he doesn't have wide enough shoulders. There's no place to put cars, and when he pulls someone over and blocks the lane, he has cars going past him at 60 miles an hour, in what should are 50, 60 miles an hour, and what should be a low speed zone. Um, so the city 
is of Gerhardt is looking to do a what they call a road going from four lanes back to two lanes with a center turn lane. And that's something that they're probably going to pursue. If passing in Gerhardt goes away, this passing zone that we have um, in Warrington will be the only passing zone for 11 miles. Um, people are impatient enough knowing they have some passing zones. If we didn't have passing zones, no telling what the behavior would be. Uh, so anyway, right now we're 80% designed on the project. Um, it will make a safer intersection. The city of Warrington uh, didn't come out and say that they were in favor of the project. But they essentially voted that, well, we won't oppose it. Go ahead and build it, ODOT. So that's kind of what we decided in November from them. Um, the county had asked us to look at the speeds in the corridor and do a speed study. And uh, one of the ODOT persons has said, oh, yeah, we can do that. But it turns out speed studies had to be requested. So I talked to Ted and give him the form so he can actually submit the request to get the process started. And my, my bad for not realizing that, Monica, when we earlier. Uh, so our high accident locations have actually down closer to Sunset Lane and Colby Lake. You know, in, anywhere you have, you know, 10, 12, 20 houses and people are having to come in and try to fit into those gaps to get out into the highway. Um, Commissioner Thompson told me the other day that there was a couple of uh, fatals in Rockaway. Um, I know that there was one down by Colby Lake. Um, we've had several that happened in Gearhart, you know, not too ter terribly long ago. So the, the, the tourist volume and the volume of traffic that we're seeing really had, you know, used to tourist season on the last five months. Well, now it seems like they're here for eight months, nine months, and the off season is much shorter, uh, even with COVID. So um, we believe that the project's the right thing to do. Uh, we're looking forward to bidding it in October and then constructing it in 2022. Uh, so with that, I'd just like questions. Um, I, I didn't bring any, I didn't give any uh, layouts of the intersection and, and those kind of things. Um, but going to meeting isn't great for presenting that type of stuff. Uh, but any information that you guys want or questions that you want answered, I have the emails for uh, Teresa and Monica and just me your list of questions and I'll make sure to get the links back to you guys and information. So. Great. Thank you, Tony. Any questions? I, I was, the sheriff is here. I was going to ask the sheriff if he had any uh, comments on this. I, I think most of them have already been discussed. I think that will put additional, um, pressure on on the intersection there by Home Depot uh, that's for sure my uh, my personal experience I've, I've been to far more crashes um, between Camp Rialea and Sunset Beach Lane and primarily where people turn to go down into the uh, mobile home park um, so I mean there, there's there's that whole stretch probably needs to be evaluated uh, uh, seriously um, but this might just be a component of it. I just hope it's part of a greater plan to improve safety in that area. Thank yeah, you, Sheriff. We're, we're, we're looking at uh, elk crossing too and trying to find some way to lower the number of collisions with deer and elk through the area. Um, you know, in, in Germany and in Canada, they have these wildlife overcrossings and undercrossings, but we have so many homes and driveways and stuff that it's impossible to fence it off and funnel the air animals to one area. Uh, so I, I do know that our traffic folks are keeping an eye on it. Uh, we've had some requests from down the Colby Lake and Sunset Lane area for um, stuff. Uh, we, we, we did ask someone if this could be a safety corridor. Um, number of safety corridors in Oregon at one time. And, you know, got one on Highway 22 or Highway 99 or over by bend, you don't get one in these. And that way we don't have safety corridors popping up on every road. Um, it generally, the traffic and the accident rate that we're experiencing on US 101, um, 
frankly, it isn't as high as the worst places around the state where you are, where you do have the safety corridors. And uh, we, we do have intersections. We do the intersection, we'll take a thousand feet either side of it and look at the accidents that cover within a thousand feet of that particular intersection. And so right now, uh, Class of County doesn't have a single intersection that's in the top 10% on the state list. You know, so it it feels more dangerous. It feels more uh, scary using 101 and trying to get on and off of it. But I guess people are just being more cautious. Uh, most of us that, that I'm sure the sheriff sees foolish people that are not more cautious. Uh, Commissioner Toyoka. Yeah, thank you, sir. This county has question on uh, is there any discussion of reopening at least southbound traffic from Dolphin to 101 to relieve some of that congestion at Ensign? The, the congestion at Ensign and the level of service, which is the traffic engineer way of saying how an intersection works, um, the, the congestion at Dolphin hasn't rose to a level, you know, there's a lot of intersections in Portland and Eugene and Medford and places like that that operate way worse than the intersection does at Dalton. For, the, for those of us that are used to going where we want to go and getting there, it's really inconvenient to wait for a light to get out of Wendy's or to make your turn out of Home Depot or something. Um, County Council had to comment. I, I just I just wanted to, a little bit of a clarification and take a little bit of responsibility um, for something I perhaps I didn't do. I know Commissioner Toyoka, um, myself and Don and Monica talked about um, a potential conflict of interest um, after talking to Commissioner Toyoka. And I think we're in that area that I'm, I'm not so sure whether we're looking for a recommendation from ODOT. So I guess that's my question um, for, from the presenter. Are you looking for a recommendation from um, this board? Um, actually, if you guys were to come out and be opposed to the project, we would take that into consideration. But, you know, it was back in October and November during the design process that we were discussing whether or not we could cancel the project. Right now, we're intending to go forward and do the project and use the safety money. Uh, one other aspect is if the project were canceled, it would not remain, the ODOT money wouldn't remain in Classic County. It goes to the next highest on the list. And so my my nightmare would be we cancel a safety project and then three months later someone died at that intersection, especially with the new schools going in and stuff. So um, really not looking for a recommendation from you guys. Um, like to take into account what you what you say and know, but you know the the, iner the inertia on this and the, the need to do it is is it's kind of overwhelmed my ability to stop it now. Thank you. That answers my question. Uh, Commissioner, you had asked about opening that other lane. Um, when ODOT came in and closed that, they actually purchased um, an anti-access easement, so to speak, through that area. One of the reasons why the accident rate along the stretch of highway is 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 safer than other sections is uh there's no access they limit the number of places you can come on and off and it's safer because of that and especially as the traffic increases in the future i talked to the planners and the traffic engineers who originally went in and made that deal and it was a deal between the uh, the city of warrington and odot that this is what's going to happen how it's going to happen and it was part of the Given us access of Ensign is the, the, the to get access of Ensign, you got to give this away. And so that was the deal. Uh, it's something carved in uh, the Ten Commandments. It can't be changed one day down the road if situations change. But right now, I couldn't find anybody inside of ODOT that was involved in this that uh, would be entertain it. Oh, thank you. I was just I was questioning that because some there are days when you see traffic from Highway 101 all the way to Spur 104 and beyond, you know, waiting for yes. that light. And, and as we're looking at, you know, let's say the Warrington Business Park or we have further development, 
you know, the traffic click count, well, I think by naturally will increase, how would it impact that? That was my, where I was going with this question. Yeah, I think City of Warrington had, had redone their uh, transportation system plan rather recently, talking to our ODOT planner that was working with them. And I am sure as we get further out into the future that there will have to be some changes to, uh, to take into account the growth of Warrington and, and the entire tourist industry and the amount of traffic that puts on one-on-one. Well, we've exhausted the, uh, the the time on this, but if we can get two more questions in real fast, I see Commissioner Thompson, Commissioner Webb both have questions. You can make them quickly. You know Go I doc. You know I talk fast. So the the overriding problem is we don't adequately fund ODOT. We're not paying for our roads, so we really have to look at that because every time we talk about ODOT, we have to talk about we don't have enough money. So that's a larger long-term down the road issue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Webb. Yeah, I, um, I'm actually uh, very concerned about the Dolphin Road access point. I'm more concerned about that than, although obviously the statistics on Perkins Road are really scary, um, but the future development that um, is going to happen around the new school site uh, a lot of which can be very commercial. Um, I'm I'm very concerned about, and I it worries me that that if um, if we're if we're if it's going to continue to be possible between Perkins Road and Ensign um, to have some kind of a passing capability, uh, to me, that's going to make the Dolphin Road issue even worse because it's going to increase speeds. Uh, and yes. I'm, um, you know, is there any long term? I mean, surely when the school and the other developments up there were approved, uh, the city of Warrington must have had some kind of transportation conditions um, in that approval. Does, um, am I wrong about that? That I mean, well, especially judging from the uh, confusion that there has been around the um, around the business park uh, right. and and the jail, um, you know, we're just going to see increased traffic in that whole area. Uh, can't we do something more than this small project to to anticipate that those problems that are going to be, I think, very dangerous. Right. One of our difficulties. Um, is ODOT funding is reactionary. You know, we have such a need on our system to fix places where we're getting hurt and injured and dying today that we're not afforded the luxury to go, we're going to need this, you know, 12 years from now, let's fix it now so it doesn't become a problem. We, we really can't afford those. Our access management and development review is primarily for businesses and developments that have their access coming straight out onto the highway. You know, it's the county and it's the city because of their zoning and their urban growth boundary and all that, that they do the development and the driveways and access that drop onto the city roads and count, city streets and county roads. So our planners will participate in the overall uh, transportation assistance plan and those types of things. But um, we really don't have a lot of say on what happens once you get away from the highway and you're accessing your own road systems? Thank you, Thank Tony. You. I can't um, see the and, and, stuff. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think you know we can bring this back at some point in time. Maybe the city of Warrenton and the county commission can have a discussion about that whole corridor. Um, and the, the, Thank you very much, Tony. Appreciate the, the discussion. Uh, we'll move on to Item five, which is the ordinance amendments, use county right of way. And that's on page eight of the packet. Uh, hello, commissioners. Uh, this is Ted McLean, public works director. <clears throat> hello. And uh, am I good to go? <laughs> You're good to go. Okay, thank you. Um, so we wanted to come before you today to talk about uh, 
our discussions that we've had in the past, the moratorium that we have on the use of the county right away, uh, in particular businesses within the right away. So just to start off a little bit of history, I'm sure you are aware of this, but um, the Public Works Department has the uh, authority uh, to issue permits to work within or to uh, do anything within the county right away. And county right away is uh, really for uh, access to properties and utilities, drainage, things such as these, those type of activities. Um, <clears throat> we really uh, wouldn't uh, want a business, a viable business to work within the county right away. Now, for many, many years, um, and in particular, we'll go back to what we talked about, uh, where this all came from, is a business that's operating in the Ridge Road area uh, that uh, sells firewood. And um, <clears throat> our discussion here is really uh, and making these decisions is based on this particular activity that had actually happened there in that area for many, many years. Maybe not this person, different persons have had these types of activities. And we've allowed them in the right of way um, <clears throat> because they're uh, in this particular area, right of ways are normally about 60 feet wide. This particular right away is 160 feet wide. So we haven't really uh, asked for them to fill out a permit to operate uh, there because this isn't a business, uh, at least from our point of view, it's just like a flower stand, uh, which we see all the way up and down uh, the highways and on county roads. You'll see flower stands on the side of the road you'll see people selling uh, different things or uh, even our children, uh, uh, you know, can uh, sell things for school or whatever it might be, maybe cookies for the uh, groups or whatever. So I'm not trying to compare uh, this small thing with children to this, but these are businesses that get money uh, for what they're selling. And we've never regulated these type of activities uh, unless there's a safety issue. And um, in this particular site that we have the disturbance, um, in speaking with the city of Warrington, there was a safety issue. There was the, the operation was blocking a fire access. And that's very clear to all of us. And so when there's safety issues like that, we're gonna step in and do something about it. And um, also I talked to, with this matter of safety and responsibility, I talked to the public works director for the city of Warrington, and that was his main concern is uh, safety. But then we talked a little bit also about Whose responsibility is it when a road runs through a city? And so it changes responsibility a little bit um, or whose jurisdiction it is, uh, only in the sense that we're partners working together with the city and we have regulations as well as they have regulations. So anybody that wanted to work within the right of way uh, has to uh, get approvals from both agencies that work together. And so that's, in this particular situation, we didn't have, we weren't requiring permits in the past. Now we are for these operations and we've only done this for the last year or two since this situation came up. And, um, <clears throat> and really this situation uh, in my look at it is more of a civil matter because uh, we can and we have regulated people working in the right-of-way we do it 
And we, if, if they're not following our permit, then we revoke the permit and they're not allowed to do that any longer. And it's how we've done this many times. Most of the time, these activities include someone's building a fence in the county right away or uh, someone is planting vegetation in the county right away that we don't want there. And we don't want, they kind of take ownership once they start planting in the county right away. So we make sure that those things don't happen. Um, so through this process, um, we've looked at the definition of a business. Uh, we've looked at the ordinances involved. Uh, County Code of Regulations, the different ORSs that describe uh, things such as a road running through a county road running through a city and us working together with the jurisdictions. Um, and then we looked at, um, uh, I put a call out to Oregon counties to um, see how they're handling these type of situations. And they too, the majority of them are handling them like we are. Um, they'll allow uh, if, if some of these type of activities, like someone selling flowers, or one of them uh, responded with, I don't want to regulate someone selling balloons for Valentine's Day, or uh, those type of things. And um, only one county really came back to us with a strict policy on this, and that was Deschutes County, where they don't allow any commercial uh, business in the right of way. And, and I, I, a lot of that for them had to do with um, food carts and things such as this, which have a higher regulation. And I don't, I don't know if it totally meant these type of activities, whether they allow it or not. Um, and then also parking in the right of way. They want people's accesses to get to their property so they're not on the county right. -of -way. So those were the comments I got back from other counties um, and, and that they've responded much like we have. And um, <clears throat> we've spent a lot of time, as you can see, we spent a lot of time and money on this particular matter that is what I consider two people fighting and then dragging our both the city of Warrington and Classic County into this. And um, we've spent a lot of mon money doing that. And the, the change in any in the uh, ordinance that you make is going to impact all the county, not just this situation. It's going to impact anyone, uh, possibly, if uh, selling anything within the right of way. And they'll have to have a permit. And it changes our discretion also as the public works director and what we, how we manage the right of way and within the laws, the ORSs and the ordinances that you uh, put forth. Um, it changes our discretion on what we will allow, what we won't allow. And, uh, so um, at this point, we're seeking the board's direction on these two points of should residents be allowed to conduct business within the county right of way? And if business is allowed to be conducted within the county right of way, what restrictions and requirements would the board like uh, to see made? Well, Rather than the commission just uh, coming up with the direction, I'm just curious what the recommendation from staff is. What is the recommendation from Public Works? Well, my first my first look at this, um, I got tired of, uh, to be honest with you, of all the stuff from different from the city of Warrington and as well as our department and all the groups of people that are influencing this one situation. And so my first go at this, I just don't want any commercial business. I don't want anything in the county right away because it's not what it's for. 
and take it to their own property and we'll give them an access to their own property. But then um, talking to others in our department, that means you're gonna regulate flower stands. You're gonna, and we have lots of those all up and down the coast that uh, it's kind of a, a thing in this area. And uh, you're gonna regulate um, other people, uh, for instance, uh, I don't want to use children, you know, I don't want to create that drama, but uh, a parent and children in the right of way, uh, maybe uh, selling their cookies or whatever it might be uh, for school uh, or um, for their clubs or whatever it might be. And uh, so, I don't want to see, I want to regulate with the existing ordinance that we have and use the, um, the power of this uh, ordinance um, to regulate the right of way. And if someone is not following the guidelines uh, of the permit, um, and that's the other difficult part is if we, if we allow every, if we make it to it, everybody has to have a permit. Um, that can be difficult, um, but we could do that. Um, but I still think we could probably regulate everything with this. If a person isn't following the permit guidelines, then we will revoke it, and then we'll um, we'll have to engage the the sheriff to help us uh, to clear that out of the right way. Okay, I see Commissioner, I see some hands up. Commissioner Bangs. You're on mute. I will win with electronics one day. Um, so basically as the ordinance is currently written, anyone wanting to sell anything can set up in a county right away and sell something. Um, I'm wondering if we we develop some sort of hobby versus um, commercial. Um, the flower stands and the the kids and the parents and the people selling the berries and because it happens all up and down the highways and up all, all up and down the the county um, right of ways. That's more of a hobbyist style situation. It's not a permanent well. It's not a permanent structure as in it is a structure that is either movable or um, it's not a permanent placement for a business. When you, when, when you hit a commercial or an income driven um, business where it is somebody's sole, um, sole income, I, I, I feel like that, that should come with a different set of rules. Um, if the structure is more, if it's staffed, uh, cause as is, it's almost sounds like I could say, I want a farm stand in such and such right away, you know, however many miles from my house and I could sit there all day long and have a semi-permanent structure farm stand, which I don't think is what we're wanting as a county to, to have. So I think we're, we're looking at hobby versus commercial. And I think what Ted is trying to say is he's he's more apt to go for the hobby versus the commercial. And then we need to develop some sort of definition or defining line. Is is am I am I hearing this correctly? Yeah, it's a catch twenty two because really any activities like this in the right of way. If there's any sort of safety issue at all, then there it has to come with insurance, and and that's and Joanna might help me with that. Uh, we've Can allowed I? these we've allowed these small businesses, and in a sense, uh, because of the safety issues. And in a sense, oh, we probably shouldn't, but that's what we've done. 
Well, can I just inter interject one one moment more? I 100% agree with that because as a property owner, we've been put in positions in rural county where people have set up on our property and it is a major safety hazard. And if somebody ha if something happens to someone on that property via a car accident because of congestion or anything like that, we are liable. And so yeah. it's, yeah, no, I thank you, Ted. Sorry. <laughs> God, well, it is a catch. Oh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Ted. No, uh, Commissioner Webb. Um, my concern is entirely about the, the liability issue, um, and I'd love to hear from county council uh, about her feelings about that, because it seems to me that that if uh, it, 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 these things are, are very um, fudgy and most people don't even understand what the right of way is in front of their property. Uh, and um, and if something happens, whether it is a permanent business or Girl Scout cookies, um, people will come after the county because we've got the deepest pockets. Uh, and um, so I, I'd kind of like to hear from our county council about her thoughts on this. Okay. Joanna? So I think um, you all are dead on about concerns that we would have for folks operating in the right of way, special commercial activities. And I think that's one of the reasons that you are required to get a permit to operate in the right of way or to be located in the right of way. And that's why we have a permit procedure. As part of our permit, now correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Ted, is that we require number one for the property owner to indemnify the county for any of their own negligence. So that means they step, they would be required to, if they got sued, to come in and um, uh, basically take over the county's position and say, hey, no, I'm responsible. Um, the second part of that indemnification um, requirement is insurance. And so we would require the permit holder to have um, insurance. And it's pretty standard in any one of our contracts that we have. Um, I'm fairly certain it's probably in some of those more long-standing, uh, for example, commercial leases that we have in the right-of-way that we require those things. So um, if we if we don't have it, I would be very very surprised. So does that answer some of your questions, Commissioner Webb? Thank you. Do we require insurance currently? No not on these type of operations and prior to um i think it's only been in the last year or two that we started making these businesses uh, get permits okay. and in that permit um we haven't it's left to the discretion of the director which is uncomfortable if there's a issue with insurance that needs to be uh, taken care of. Um, go ahead, Joanna. I was just going to say, I'm fairly, I'm fairly certain it would be included in the leases that we've done, right? Because we've done a couple leases, and I'm certain it would be included in those leases. And so we're just talking about a couple of permits that we've issued, not, we're not talking hundreds, okay? So I just want to put that in perspective yeah and and so that's the problem uh at this point i guess is whether these little flower stands or these wood uh producers do they produce enough money to provide uh insurance for those operations um you know that might that'd be interesting to find out mr thompson Thank you, Mr. Chair. So anytime we leave it up to somebody's discretion and have different sets of rules for different kinds of people, I think we're headed for trouble. We need objective, legal, ethical standards. I, you know, consider the optics, we're gonna shut down the Girl Scout cookie stands. I'm really sorry. You know, I'm for, I'm for selling Girl Scout cookies. I am for the flower stands, I am for all of that. But as county officials, what we're looking at is how do we protect all the county taxpayers 
and really public safety. Because look, if somebody gets hurt, I don't want to be responsible for that because I said, oh, sure, it's okay because it's flowers or cookies or whatever. That's a bad idea. How do we have this? How do we have a place where people can do what they need to do safely and legally? I think that's what we need to look at, not to um, set up situations where we put somebody in a bad position having to make a judgment call, get second guessed, and and we don't want to we don't want to be doing that to our staff. Ted's nodding. I think that's a good idea, huh, Ted? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and there is. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Ted. Okay. Um, there is discretion for the director or who who he assigns out of our office, but, but uh, we would always consider these issues that we're talking about before we use that discretion. Um, sometimes uh, uh, people wanted to put uh, a fence in the county right away. And if if it's appropriate and it, uh, that's a discretion that I could have um, just because of where fences have been and they may be off a foot here or foot there or whatever it might be. We've allowed that by permit. Um, but in those permits, we're not requiring insurance. Um, and maybe that's something that we need to change too. I'm not sure. But there is a lot of discretion in our permit process. And, that, um, and that's why we've, we've allowed these businesses for many, many years to operate that way. Okay, Commissioner Banks. I think with the exponential growth that we're seeing in our county, uh, you know, over the next decade, it would be probably behoove us to put in black and white some clear guidance for our county staff um, and also for our constituents, just as from here moving forward. Um, I don't foresee that we're going to have less business or fewer businesses wanting to operate in county right of ways. I feel like if we can offer a clear black and white guidance that can be followed, that it takes the pressure off of our county staff of trying to weigh who should and who shouldn't, so on and so forth. I think that that just might be, and I, I feel that it's probably for, for another session, um, but that to just to acknowledge that there is, there is a hole um, that we need to figure out how to fill. And I'm not one that likes to write more policy and create more rules, but I feel like for the safety and well-being of our community and for our, you know, county staff and, you know, also covering our butt, um, <laughs> it might be behoove us to put some stuff in writing, so. Any other comments? Mr. Toyoka, did you have anything you wanted to add to this discussion? Um, you know, the only thing I, I was gonna ask County Council about the liability issues, I think we've covered that, but I am in favor of a, you know, we don't need discretion or, you know, subjectivity. It should be a standard policy of how we operate in the county. And, you know, again, limits the liability to the county and it's it takes away all that subjectivity. So then public works doesn't have to decide, is this a good one or a bad one? It's just a set policy. I think that's the road we should be going on. Commissioner Webb? Yeah, Commissioner um, Webb? I'm sorry, but I have to leave the meeting. Okay. I just wanted to make that official. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. So uh, have we given kind of our direction here to Ted? Sounds like uh, we're in favor of, of putting something together in the form of a, of a right away ordinance, but uh, tightening it up. Is that what I'm hearing or? So Chair Quirla, members of the board, if I might, um, if it sounds reasonable as a next step, we will take that direction. We'll have a staff and um, and county council discussion, and then we'll schedule another work session and come to, back to you and just to verify that that we're going in the right direction. Okay, sounds good, Don. Mr. Chair, I, I would just yes. suggest that before we do something that will have you know widespread public impact, that we also get some input from people 
and be prepared to explain our reasoning and and be prepared to have some people say i want my flower stands i want my girl scout cookies so when when staff does that discussion give us give us some options so that we can say to people here's your substitute satisfaction beside the road besides the right of way in the road that isn't safe really yeah so it's a it's a whole picture thank you you know commissioner Thank you, Commissioner Thompson. I, you know, I know Alan Barry's here, and I know we don't usually allow for comment from the public during our work session, but I saw you had your hand up. You want to say something real quick? Sure, if you don't mind. I want to thank uh, Antley and my surveyor for giving me a schooling. I want to appreciate that. And number two, uh, my stand wasn't in the way of the fire truck. I called the fireman out here to clarify that. And number two, three, I think a good idea would be to uh, charge like a $50 for the, the uh, permit. And uh, that would help out uh, for some of it for the cost for the county. Uh, I think that would be fair for all of us who's selling on the right of way. And uh, uh, my uh, home insurance covers everything I do out there. I've made sure of that, so I'm covered. Um, and I agree with everything y'all said today, and I appreciate y'all taking the effort to have this. Uh, but I think a uh, $50 fee for the permit to have the business on the right-of-way is fair for the the class of county and everything to help y'all offset uh y'all's time to come out and everything and to give the permit thank so you, I just Mary. Want, uh, thank you and thank everything y'all are doing i appreciate it thank you okay we've got two more items i believe on the agenda the Jail relocation project update and guaranteed maximum price contract. And uh, Sheriff Phillips. All right, thanks, Sheriff Quayla. Um, I'm gonna make this quick because uh, Monica wrote a beautiful informational summary, uh, but just to kind of recap it, in November of 2018, uh, we took to the voters a, a fairly modest jail design and uh, what we were hoping to be was a palatable $20 million ask. Uh, we were right. Um, the, the county was going to contribute $3 million from special projects, and then we were blessed with a $3.44 million bond premium, which got us to um, a, a total budget for the project at $26.4 million. Uh, with the extra money, we worked with DLR to design what we thought was probably more like that 95% of everything we could have asked for um, at that time. Our estimates showed that we were going to be able to afford that project. When we took it out to bid, and I think it was May, um, we were surprised. Uh, it turned out we were about 25% over budget. So we cut some scope out and took it out to bid again, and it remained over budget. And so the county manager and I had a, a discussion with uh, just the owners of Cornerstone Project Man Management, the owner of Emric, and the principal from DLR, and said, you know, guys, from the beginning, we hired you to be a team. You said you'd be a team and you haven't come through really working as a team uh, because there started to be some finger pointing. Uh, we gave them a deadline to come back to us with a plan to be on budget with uh, without every scope reduction that they had, had floated because uh, we knew there were things that they could do to save money uh, and get us what we wanted. They just needed to work a little harder on it and in a, a coordinated way. And so anyways, uh, that was ultimately successful. Um, we've uh, got back a classification. Um, it was like I was talking to Don the other day. Uh, we don't always get everything we want, but, but I think that uh, we're at least 70% or more of everything we could ask for, which is actually gonna be a wonderful jail that will suit the needs of the sheriff's office and, and the community for for a long time. Uh, the guaranteed maximum price that we have come up with right now is $23,748,114. So are there any questions? 
Any questions from the commission? Okay, thank you, Sheriff. Appreciate the update. Glad that it's moving forward. Yep, I'm excited to break ground. Me too. Not as much as you, but very excited to see it go. I'm very excited. This will be a great facility. Absolutely. Next is the outcome reports for COVID-19 small grants program. So Commissioner Quayla, members of the board, if I might uh, introduce Amanda Rappenchuk, who's new to the county. Um, she's a management policy analyst with the county manager's office, and we are very happy and um, privileged to have her join our, our team. Um, and so I'll go ahead and turn it over to Amanda. Thanks. Um, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here, excited to be a part of the team. Um, I, In the summary, I kind of listed out the individual organizations that were awarded the grant and how much was spent. So I'm just going to go through it really quickly. Um, overall, it was $50,000 that went toward the COVID-19 relief. Um, and it was a, a maximum of 10,000 per grant. Um, so the first one on there you see is Claptop Community Action. Um, one of the things that I thought was pretty special that they put on their report, um, they said many families express interest in giving back and volunteering in the community that has taken the time to care um, for them so much. And so I thought that that was pretty special. Um, this had to do with housing insecurity and then transportation and packaging supplies um, for our produce pantries. And so that one was awarded 7,450. Um, the next one was Clotsop Emergency Food Bank. Um, and one of the unique things about this one is they were able to expand what they normally provide for personal hygiene products. So you'll see that list, there's a lot of items. And now that they're um, with that funding that we gave them, which was uh, 5,500, um, they're able to continue to provide those hygiene products. Um, and they also provide um, food to community members as well. The next one, uh, filling empty bellies uh, between this and their current funding that was provided, which we provided them with 6,000. Um, they served over 4,600 meals, including two holiday meals, Thanksgiving and Christmas um, from June through December. So that's pretty special. Um, and then there's kind of some lists of, of specific uses of those funds. Uh, next, Helping Hands Reentry Outreach Centers. Um, the grant was able to support their general operations and I kind of listed out a few different things um, in regards to their shelters from Seaside and Astoria. Um, let's see. And the total that they were provided with was 10,000. Um, and this was unique from their report. They said that they were hit hard financially at the onset of COVID and they talked about how that impacted um, those that they serve as well, um, so that this emergency support from the county helped to mitigate those initial losses so that they could focus their energy on providing um, assistance and services. Um, and then Restoration House, they supported um, just being able to create COVID response efforts. So one of that was being able to get poor people's jobs back. Um, and then also just uh, being able to follow CDC procedures. Um, it also supported their payroll and replaced wooden bunk beds with steel frames. Um, and one of the things that they said was the funding received has allowed RH's existence to continue over the past four months without significant interruption to help reduce destructive behaviors of vendors while enhancing general public safety. And that award was for 6,050. Um, the sixth one is Society of St. Vincent um, de Paul Seaside Conference. And they supported, uh, their services had to do with financial aid and um, providing food. They were able to provide rental assistance for 11 families and utilities for 11 families. Um, and then they were able to provide food items and that total award was 5,000. And the last one, which is the seventh agency is the Harbor. Um, they had coordinated with another grant that we had provided, um, which was a, a $5,000 grant. Their COVID grant was from us was 10,000 and through that um, emergency services, expenses were covered for about 45 to 50 survivors and families. Um, they were able to do emergency services, technology services and technology equipment and device expenses. So 
Are there any questions about uh, the COVID-19 small grants program? Any questions for Amanda? Well, that's fantastic. Great uh, organizations all, and I'm so glad that they were able to get some assistance. Yeah, very exciting. All right, thank you, Amanda. And uh, last, we, we did skip over the health, uh, public health report at the very beginning. Uh, County Manager, did you have anything that you wanted to update the group on? Sure, I'll just provide a little um, update, just real brief. Uh, we continue to do immunization activities. Um, this week, we have 230 doses of first dose vaccine that will be scheduled out. And then we have roughly 800 doses of second. And so um, we are really into that really busy schedule now of both first dose activities and second dose. And so you'll see a lot of different dispensing activities every week now. Um, what we are hoping though, is that we get more first doses so that we can accelerate uh, the number of uh, community members that can get started into the vaccination process. So uh, a lot of activity, the vaccine task force is still doing yeoman's work and coordinating, providing all the logistics, all the planning and the communication. And so I just wanna continually thank them for all of their efforts. Chris Lehman from CMH is uh, the incident commander on, uh, on that team. And we appreciate his efforts as well as the efforts of Providence uh, public health, certainly, and uh, all of our other partners. So the work continues. Yeah, thank you, County Manager. I echo what you say. It's a it's a huge community effort, a cooperative effort on the part of the two hospitals and County Health Department, and they're doing a great job. It's, a, it's amazing how much work that goes into it. So uh, we keep moving forward and improving the process as we go. Does anybody else have anything for the good of the group here? Do we have any other items? Nope. Okay, we're good. Thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of your week. We'll talk to you later.